Thank you all for coming to my talk. My name is Diana and we also have Karen in the room but she just disappeared. So I don't know what she's doing. <laughs> um, thank you very much. So we're going to talk about Core Watch at the University of Queensland. Uh, let me figure out technology. Yes, thank you. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the coral reefs throughout Australia and pay my respects to elders, past, present and emerging. So when we start, I'd like to ask who has used the coral watch, coral health chart? Quite a few, but not all. Great. Otherwise I could go if everybody had done it already. Nah, there is some new things in here. So basically with Coral Watch, we look at the color of the reef as an indicator of coral health. So we have this beautiful brown coral colony. This can change due to coral bleaching into a white coral colony. And that can be changed, that can be measured with the coral health chart plus all the various stages in between. So a little bit about coral bleaching. So I'm taking the citizen science approach, not assuming that everybody in the audience is familiar with what we're talking about. So a little bit of background. So basically corals are an animal, they live together with a plant, they have a symbiotic relationship. The plant provides food and color to the coral and the coral provides a nice home. On the moment there is stress involved and often that is warm seawater temperature. The um, symbiotic relationship breaks down and the coral kicks out the algae and we see a coral, white coral skeleton. So this is a very bleached reef and it's not always that it's just white. Often you see also fluorescent colors in there. And at this stage it can actually weird enough look quite beautiful. Um, but of course, this is a very bad health state of the reef. Now, the good news is that corals can recover. However, we see a, a very much increase in bleaching events. And especially if we look at the last seven years, we have had four bleaching events and sometimes back to back. So corals can hardly a chance to recover and they get hit again by the next bleaching event. So it's not just on the GBR, it is a global event and it is really uh, a result of seawater temperature increase which causes more bleaching events and more severe bleaching events. This is directly a result from climate change. So climate change is the biggest threat to reefs and the uh, biggest solution we see is reducing carbon emissions. And we are working on a new program where we will focus on that and I will talk about that a little bit later. So how does Coral Watch um, basically contribute to coral bleaching research, education, management, um, but also community awareness? So the chart was developed in 2002 and if we look at the different colors on the chart that are the most common colors on the reef and the different um, color blocks are basically related to the number of Susan Tally that is present in the coral at the time of bleaching or health state. So it's a peer-reviewed method. There are many scientists who use the Coral Watch chart for, as an additional method to their research and they publish lots of papers. Unfortunately, they don't enter a lot of data on our database and our database, uh, the contributors are mainly citizen scientists. And if we look worldwide, then overseas, we have a lot of dive centers and conservation volunteer organizations involved. And in Australia, we have a lot of schools involved. This is a direct result of lots of teacher workshops that we basically run on an annual base so we get lots of teachers involved and they bring it back to their schools so in Queensland I believe there's about 40 schools collecting coal data. 
So how does it work? It's very simple. You basically hold the jar next to the polar colony and you measure the lightest and the darkest. This gets recorded on a little slate and you also record the plate branching or soft or boulder coral type. So these are shapes that you can relate to if you are a non-scientist. That gets together with a little bit of metadata about the site and um, the date and depth and temperature. It all gets um, entered into the uh, global database, which is since three years with the Atlas of Living Australia. It's a fantastic platform. It has allowed us now to also enter photos. So we've got lots of um, photos on there. People can upload reef scape photos, but also individual corals. You can identify species if you are at that level. So it provides lots of extra um, features. So globally, so we are a global program and we have data from 80 countries. And um, of course, not every country is well presented and you can see our top countries at the bottom and Australia is the, the um, country where we have most of the data from. Of course, we had a little dip for a few years. Don't know what happened there in 2020, 2021, but we're climbing nicely back up to numbers before. So now something new, and we're super excited about this because this is hopefully live by the end of next week. So we love the ALA database, but it is a data depository. And what we're missing is the feedback, direct feedback to our users. And this is what we have been developing with um, Josh Pessinger, a data developer, who has now basically pulls off the data on a daily base from the ALA and automated graphs for us that directly feeds the feedback to our users. So basically you can zoom in on the map wherever you like to go and you can find surveys and look at the survey results and look at all the, these different tabs that will explain you about color and coral type, the composition. So this is automated, generated. It will give you an average color score over time. And this will um, already show you if there is potential bleaching. Um, so, but for the potential bleaching, we even have a separate tab that will also show you the percentage bleaching that is um, potentially present within the survey. We always say potential bleaching because there are more things than bleaching what makes a coral white, as we all, as we probably all know. So, um, plus we're working with citizen scientists. So it's a first indicator that there might be bleaching on your reef. And this bleaching indication is based on the hard corals in the survey because soft corals can be a bit temperamental and a bit quick to bleach. So we base it on the hard corals um, and the average result needs to be lower than a 2.1. So if going back to the data map, it has two um, tabs. It has the all data tab and it has the uh, potential bleaching tab. And you can just select a date range and look what's happening during that time. So one of our, um, one of the groups, NOAA, National Oceanic Atmospheric agency in the States, they are very interested in this new overview. Basically, I don't know if you're familiar with them, but they um, predict bleaching based on water temperature. But what they don't have is validation on the ground from all the areas where they predict bleaching. So citizen science data can really help them with feeding back to their system to what they predicted is also really happening or not. So this leads straight back into management and it's a fantastic new feature that we're 
really excited about to launch hopefully on the 1st of December. Fingers crossed. <laughs> so Core Watch is not only about monitoring, we also do lots of other things. It really started as a monitoring project. Uh, we exist now 21 years. I've been with the project for 16. I've done a bit of the journey. I came on board with the book um, Core Reefs and Climate Change, which is really focused on citizen science, community level, explaining what's happening. And we have uh, developed lots of um, education materials and curriculum linked materials. We run a lot of workshops, teacher workshops, community workshops, basically to um, raise awareness about reefs in all different ways. We create a lot of resources. This is one of them, just simple fact sheets that can provide um, the understanding at a community level. The back of this um, fact sheet of the GBR is the what can I do um, option. And uh, this is something where we really want to expand to. We have um, had a safe reefs from home program for a long of lo uh, for a long time, but we want to create an interactive education platform where we collect data on what kind of behaviours people do to help um, reduce carbon um, to help reduce impact on reefs and what they are willing to do and what other things they don't do. So we try to identify the gaps where people need more information or more inspiration, potentially, to um, help reach. Because everybody can be a citizen scientist, but what we find, it's not everyone who wants to go out to the reef and be a citizen scientist there, but you can be a citizen scientist at home and help reach from home. So this whole um, new program is really focused on the fact that the biggest threat to reefs is climate change and that we can all do our bit with reducing carbon emissions. And um, we're going to work together with social scientists to find the best approach to inspire people to reduce carbon for the reef. Another program that I did get the chance to talk about already a bit before. Um, I don't know, most of you were here. If you were not here, um, everybody can get involved with Coral Watch. And you can also take it to the next level and become um, a volunteer for the program. We have a very exciting, very intense workshop on Heron Island. People pro propose ideas how they want to help reefs. And we work together to make that a realistic plan and work and keep on working together. Um, it's like a volunteer commitment for a year. Most people say after a year, do I have to leave now? No, nobody has to leave at any time. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? We have one down the back here. I'm on my train journey. Um, it's just a really simple question. Um, on the colour chart, there are no blues, and yet we come across blue corals. Yes, that's a very good question. So the reason there is no blue on the chart is blue corals have pigment and Susan Tally, so the symbiotic algae. And the chart, was based on all um, experiments, lab experiments, where we only, um, where you can't uh, include blue corals because of the pigment, because they respond basically different to bleaching and they keep their color, so they stay blue. But then there are also corals that can turn blue, fluorescent, when they, when they bleach. So it's a bit confusing, but basically the Short and simple answer, if the colour is not on the chart, you can't measure it. So you stick to these colours. 
um, quick question uh, about the ambassador um, program. Yeah. Um, can, can you tell us what are the incentives that you use to attract uh, the ambassadors? And uh, if you have a campaign to look for them or if they reach out to you uh, voluntarily? Yeah. Well, applications are open at the moment. It's all on our Facebook and Instagram and website. And um, applications are already coming in because we run now the seventh ambassador workshop. So people have heard from others about it. So we don't really have to do much campaigning. On average, we get about 40 applications a year and we select 15 which is always very hard because uh, people come up with the most amazing projects and ideas how they want to help reefs. So, yeah, I think for now we don't really have to inspire people anymore. It's a, it's a well-known program, apparently. So, um, yeah, people are keen to get involved, hear from others about it. But the strength of the program is, I think, really the fact that you work with your passion so what do you want to do to help reefs and it's not us telling oh help us do this so ambassadors get um, access to all our resources we help them with organizing whatever they want to organize we will support them um, and um, yeah that's basically why it has been so successful. Uh, hey, thanks for that. Um, I'm a huge fan of coral watch. We talked during the break. Um, I've used it in my research just to check on the health of my corals in the tank. Just have the card pinned up on the acrylic. And uh, I use it a lot with um, the citizen science programs that we do with Reef Ecologic. It's a very yeah, popular thank you for that. Tool. Yeah, you're very welcome. Um, I guess a question I have for you is, can you just talk about why those four growth forms were selected and how you handle things like submassive corals or corals that are like folios corals, things that don't fit the uh, growth form? Yeah, very good question. I wasn't there at the stage that the coral health chart was developed, but I know the background. Um, so basically, these are shapes that people can easily recognize. The most confusing one is soft corals because, because sometimes people mix them up with sponges because they don't know the difference between a sponge and a soft coral, which you can't blame. Like, you know, it's citizen science. So we, on purpose, try to keep it as simple as possible. And then for those who know a bit more and know that there are many more coral types, they get sometimes a bit confused. So um, one of the things like, Encrusting, we say that's still kind of a boulder. While if you have folios, that becomes plate like. So you should translate plate to plate like, boulder like. And um, at the end, it is a first indication and it gives a bit of an idea of what kind of composition the reef has where there is potential bleaching. So it is, um, yeah, just an, an extra bit of data, but we try to keep that very simple on purpose because if we put 10 different coral types, then people get lost. And even though the coral watch chart is so simple, still sometimes it can be already too hard for people. So, yeah. 